introduced him by the Kansas City Shuffle. And uh, what was up with that one? Yeah, it's Chris Amos. What's going on, Ash? <laughs> really good. Really good. Uh, what was the uh, AM2600626? <laughs> We'll, we'll get that, that fixed. We'll, we'll get, get that, that fixed, fixed right after the show. show. Yeah, I guess that's the Twitter location. <laughs> so, uh, we'll lead off with a little March Madness. Yeah, look, I'm uh, forward to talking about March Madness and just, hey, welcome to everybody out there. Thank you for tuning in. You are listening to Philly Sports Talk right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all of that sports. And we're going right into the NCAA on and we, uh, last, last week, week we picked the bracket, bracket on the air, and we, we, had, we had a fun time doing it. It turns out we were uh, more accurate than I ever thought we'd be. We, uh, we entered our bracket on the ESPN, and we're sitting in 3,000th place out of 14 million brackets. So uh, we're going we're gonna to sit here and go over some picks and go over some games that, that are to come. Uh, we got... Uh, couldn't have had the uh, big upset of the tournament, which was the Oral Roberts Golden Eagles out of the South bracket advancing to the Sweet 16. Yeah, that was one I'd be surprised if anybody had them in the Sweet 16. I would say they probably didn't. With them being the second 15 seed ever to get that far, but they, they beat a good Ohio State team and they beat a decent Florida team, so obviously they're not a joke. Maybe they were seated a little bit uh, low. Absolutely, yeah, a team that, you know, didn't, didn't uh, get that much TV attention, of course, they never did, but I mean, they, they've won a game in the past, and it's hard when you get to those 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 brackets, uh, those teams, they're pretty much throw them in a hat and pull them out, the, you know, the, it's, the, this, this year you had Illinois, Ohio State, all these big 10 teams that, they didn't, they don't, like I said a million times, they don't play the caliber of teams that the teams in the ACC and the SEC play. They're just not the athletes in that conference. They're, they rack up a lot of wins early in the year against teams you know, from smaller colleges. It runs their records up, but they're just, when they get to the tournament, they don't advance. Like you see, Michigan's the only team left. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if they, if they can get, even if they can get through Creighton, Creighton can really shoot from the outside. I mean, that, that's probably their toughest game of the season. They, they play in that West Western Conference of St. Mary's, San Francisco, and they're just not they're not tested. They're they're a great team, but they're not tested. I agree with that. I think Oregon, Oregon has too much for USC. And if you tuned in last week to Philly Sports Talk, we had Gonzaga and Oregon playing in the, in the, in the Elite Eight. We also had Baylor playing Arkansas, which is still a possibility. We had Michigan playing Alabama, which is also they're both still alive. And yeah, Illinois was the only one. Uh, Loyola, Chicago, and uh, sister. Sister, sister Jean ruined it for us again. Uh, so they'll, they'll play Oregon State, and, uh, which we all we had Oregon State in the Sweet 16, the 12 seed, but we had them play in Illinois, and we had Syracuse, Houston, in the bottom, bottom Midwest uh, bracket. So we had seven of the eight Elite Eight still still remaining. Looking. They're still the they're still the favorites. They have to go. They've they've been the favorites all season long. Baylor and Gonzaga. They they've stood out from the rest of the rest of the crowd. So, do you want to uh, go ahead and pick a uh, the Sweet Sixteen games? Oregon uh, going over USC to set up that 
that Gonzaga Oregon match in the Elite Eight. And if we go down even uh, down to the east, Michigan State, Florida State, that, that is going to be a very interesting basketball game. Florida State is a better team than I, than I actually thought yep. that, that they were. I mean, they, they, they were impressed with beating Colorado the other day. They're, they're going to give Michigan all they can. I would not be surprised if Florida State wins that game, even though uh, I would still stay with our Michigan. Yeah, I'm getting back to what I just said about the, the competition. The Florida State plays in the ACC. They do. They play North Carolina, even though they had down years. They're playing top recruits. They're playing the, you know, they're, they're tournament tested throughout the season. So a team like Florida State absolutely can pull the upset over Michigan. I wouldn't be one bit surprised if they did. And then we go down. To, go. Then we go down to a very interesting matchup. UCLA. UCLA is another pedigree team. It's a team that gets top recruits in, in California. That. They had five players averaging double figures this season, and they'll take on an Alabama team that's that's been a top ten team throughout most of the season. Uh, you can pretty much toss a coin here. I mean, won't be surprised either way, but we'll stay with Alabama since we we picked them last week. I don't think they're going to get pushed over for Alabama. I think Alabama has, has enough uh, to win the game, but it's not going to be an easy one. Yeah, and then when we go over, we look, at, we look into the South bracket, it's uh, starting off with Baylor and Villanova. I think for a lot of people around here in this area, it's a surprise to see Villanova as far as they are, but... With Jay Wright as the coach, it's one of those things, too. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of coaches you can look to. Maybe not a lot, but a handful. When it comes to tournament time, it's, it's, their team is always a tough out. Villanova, of course, with Jay Wright, Jim Beheim, and Syracuse, as we can see, they're in the Sweet 16 as well. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing the other night watching the games. The NCAA is basically a coach's tournament. If you look, like you said, you have Jay Wright, you have Mark Few, you have um, – uh, Jawan Howard, who was national coach of the year in Michigan. Uh, um, you have uh, Mick Cronin, who did a great job at Cincinnati, and now the head coach of UCLA. Uh, Jim Beheim, who is doing a he, – he's revamped the, the, the matchup zone. He's, he's added some wrinkles to it. Last game against um, West Virginia. West Virginia was didn't even know what they were looking at, I think. and They still they still play tough, but – the, the maximum zone was too much. In the first round, San Diego State was just completely outclassed by Syracuse. So it's basically. Yeah. And when, when Syracuse plays that zone, just, just, just the minute that you brought that up, I mean, they, they will challenge you to make a three pointer, even a deep three pointer. You can't hit those three pointers in your team that, that, that's used to living or dying that way. Like you said, it's a struggle after that. Absolutely. And we'll see how Houston counters that and then see if Calvin Sampson has a way of coaching his team to uh, counter that zone he's going to face coming up next week. Sorry. Sorry, I'm, I'm not – I'm having some reports that we're having uh, sound issues again. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get that straightened out. I think it sounds a little better right now. I'm waiting for some feedback here. But we'll just – we'll get through it. Um, all right, so that brought us to – uh, well, that would bring us to Arkansas against uh, Oral Roberts. Arkansas, so Oral Roberts. Does the Oral Roberts magic end here in the Sweet 16? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be that would, that would be my uh, my guess that it does. But then again, I would have said that with Game One and Game Two uh, with Oral Roberts as well. Maybe as we have discussed before, they maybe uh, were seated a little bit low. Yeah, they won each game by three points. I mean, our, our both games were tough, you know, knock them out, drag them out battles, and it might have taken too much out of them. I mean, Arkansas cruised in the first round against Colgate and then squeaked by Texas Tech in the second round. So, yes, they did. Yeah, and and the Oral Roberts team, it did, it did show one thing how tough they were once they got into the overtime against Ohio State, that they, that they just were able to uh, right. play with them and keep and, and keep going and, yeah. and uh, actually come out with the win. True. And when I was watching that game, I thought once it got to overtime, it would be Ohio State all the way. I was wrong. 
yeah, especially a team that's you know doesn't play that caliber t- caliber team of Ohio State all season. Going in the overtime, you would think, that, yeah, they'd be demoralized, and Ohio State would pull away. They didn't. All right, we'll go on to uh, everybody's favorite matchup: Loyola, Chicago, and Oregon State. Um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of brackets had that game. Loyola, Chicago. You know, they 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 did make the Final Four a couple of years back, and they still have a couple of those players back at the center. I mean, he. He looks like he plays in your local YMCA league, uh, but this this team is well coached, and I don't think he's going to be their coach much longer. Pro I, th- I think he's going to get the Indiana job. This will be his last season coaching wheel at the Ramblers. Um, yeah, you you would think he'd have a couple more offers as, as well, but of yeah. course, Indiana once once they come calling for you, that's a very attractive place to go. And yeah. and and actually, uh, Indiana uh, needs some help. So, uh, Oregon State, a team that can um, really, really shoot from the outside. Um, they, they both teams, both teams can hit the threes. But well, little Chicago's defense, watching them Saturday, or was it Sunday? I'm sorry, Sunday. I'm, I'm messed up with the tournament. It started a day late this year. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, little Chicago's defense, it's almost a, a, a machine the way they rotate and they, they, they play off of each other. It's, it's they're, like I said, they're really, really well coached. I wouldn't be surprised Loyola Chicago advances here. No, I, w- I would not be surprised either. No. That'll take us to the final game, Syracuse and Houston. Houston. Houston, uh, uh, a great comeback to, to beat Rutgers. Rutgers basically fell asleep at the end and just tried to burn the clock instead of doing what they were doing all game. Which was, yeah, that was not the smartest coaching decision no. to do that the last three minutes of the game. And not at all. Not at all. He, he, he coached scared instead of coaching to win. Yes, that's what it looked like. And I, I don't know if he had a strategy behind that of thinking that trying to do that would be a way to take a little bit of pressure off the kids offensively and see if they could just clamp them down and make a few defensive stops and win the game that way. Yep. But they went away with work for them yep. for a good 37 minutes and came back to bite them. Yep, so Houston gets, gets through, gets to play Syracuse, which is going to be a um, the probably the toughest game of the season, playing in the the conference they play with, you know, Temple and Tulane. They're not they're not really playing the, the top caliber caliber teams all year. Uh, what do you think? Who are you taking here? Well, I like the way Syracuse has played, and I like the defense that they played. I think the coaching. From Syracuse, Jim Beheim is an outstanding coach, but I, I got to go with Houston. I, I just think you, you, Houston is a stronger team. I think they have actually bet, better players. Now, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see if they can figure out that zone. Yeah. But I think, if if, I think out, of the, out of these three teams that Syracuse would have played, Houston will be the one to figure out the zone, and Houston will move on to the Elite Eight. Okay. All right. We'll jump, jump back, back up to Gonzaga, Oregon. It's, it's going to be a... Much a better game than we even thought it would be after after watching these first two games. Yeah, if we have that right, and it's going to be Gonzaga against Oregon. We had discussed last week, and we had picked Oregon. And I would, I don't, I don't disagree with you, Cash. I think that's where where Gonzaga runs into trouble. Yeah, well, it'd be interesting to see the the line on that game. I, you know, I think we'll be able to tell if Vegas comes out with making Gonzaga a two three point favorite. I think we'll know then that it's going to be a, a a battle, and I think Oregon could come out ahead. Yeah, it's one of those things too, where you look at the the, the schedule. I mean, it's, it's impressive what Gonzaga's done done so far, being being undefeated. But it's it's one of those things too, where you look at some of the teams that they've played and how how they've been tested. And right now, once you get down here to uh, the Elite Eight, uh, it's definitely going to be a test. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so. Uh... Bottom. <laughs> Who do we take? Michigan, Florida State. We, 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 we talked both sides. And we did the same thing last week. We talked both sides. Well, yeah. we, 
put on last week, we put Michigan and Alabama, and, what, and we and and we went back and forth. Could, oh, is Michigan going to win this one? Could it be yeah. Alabama? We went with Alabama, so I, I I guess we're sticking with Michigan, Alabama, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess we have to. We can't. We can't go both ways. ways yeah, yeah, then, yeah, yeah, we, we have, have to stick with what we originally said. So we'll, we'll go Michigan, Alabama, Alabama which which should be a Another, another, another great, great game. game. We're, we're going to do some great, great games. games everything everything holds the way we think, we think it's going to hold. Uh, uh, that, could be, that could be the game of the tournament. Yeah. Right there, Michigan. Absolutely incredible game. Um, like we said, Michigan is still missing their, their, their best player. Right. So, uh, I'm sorry. Let me see. Okay, Alabama, Michigan is basketball, not football. <laughs> You know what? Let's, let's take a break. Let's, let's take a, um, a commercial break. I'll get some sound issues f- fixed. And, uh... Guys, we'll fix that sound issue, and we'll be right back. You're listening to Philly Sports Talk with Cash and Chris right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me and hear me good. If you like sports, then you like the Wait a Minute show. If you like Comedy. Uh, I, I see what they're saying. Then you I like the Wait a Minute show. I if you like a different opinion coming from a different angle, then you like the Wait a Minute show. So join me Saturday, 8 p.m. Oh, Eastern yeah. Standard Time uh, with your host, Jelani, J.B. Bowden, and of course, my man Lopan on the Wait a Minute show.com. Ain't that right, Lopan? I put this on the windows. They said I sound choppy and you and you, you sound far away. Yeah, I know. What's up, everybody? This is Darren Rodriguez. Are you a fan of volleyball? Are you a fan of Thunder Spikes? Then I have the show for you. Set Point, where I cover NCAA men's and women's volleyball, high school boys and girls volleyball, beach volleyball, and even professional volleyball. Catch the action every week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Is Wow. All right. All right. We'll, we'll uh, finish the bracket and we'll go right to that, I guess. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, great. Hey guys, it's Blake Henley. Better known as H-Town Blake to some of you, happy to announce that Faces Loader is back in full force. We'll be bringing that high heat every Tuesday night here on IE Sports Radio. So come home, get ready, dig into that batter's box, and see if you can chase that high heat, baby. So we'll be coming to you live with all the stats, all the rundowns, all the division rivalries, and every team that's going to make the playoff push to get to that one and only October and get to the pinnacle of what baseball is to hoist that commissioner's trophy when it's all said and done. Philly Sports Talk here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all the sports. Hopefully we got the sound uh, a little better here on, we got these problems fixed. Um, we're going to finish up our bracket, then we have some breaking news from the uh, NFL and the Eagles to go over. We'll, we'll, we'll keep you uh, teased on that one. All right, we got, where were we? We just finished up Syracuse, Houston. Yes, I think that's where we where we finished off. And we had uh, Houston going through. Okay. 
All right, we got Houston going for a uh, Tortoise two. We did Gonzaga, Oregon. We did Michigan, Alabama. Yeah, we we I, we're Baylor, Arkansas. Baylor, Arkansas. Yeah. All right, we got Baylor, who, uh, you know, the top, this is the number two team in the country, the uh, second best team in the tournament. Loaded with talent, loaded with guards. Uh, Arkansas plays a, uh, not as fast as they played in the, in the past, with the, the uh, running gun uh, up and down the court. I'd go, uh, I'd go Baylor here in a, uh, probably a 10 point win. Yeah, and we had Baylor going through when we picked last week. Actually, that's who we have uh, going into the championship game. So I am sticking with Baylor, and I think that they actually advance into uh, def definitely into the final four. Well, being that they're our, our champion, I guess they're going to go to the final four, huh? Yeah, you would think. <laughs> All right. Then we, we had Loyola Chicago playing Houston. Yes. That, that's going to be a great game. Houston probably has the athletes to to deal with Loyola's defense. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I think that Houston uh, will be taking on Baylor in the Final Four. So that sets up for us, though. In the Final Four, we have Oregon against Alabama and Baylor against Houston. Sorry, you, you can go ahead with the next game. I'm, I'm still trying to fix the audio. Okay, well, while he works on that, we were looking at the final four that we have here in our bracket, the first game being Oregon against Alabama, and we had gone with Alabama to make it to the national championship game, which is kind of interesting because Alabama in national championship games, we're usually talking football, but this year they have a very, very good basketball team, and we think they're going to make the final game. And we also believe that they're going to take on Baylor, that Baylor does come out over Houston, which is going to be an outstanding game if those two match up in a Final Four game. But Baylor then will take on Alabama for the championship. And as we said last week, we picked Baylor as the national champion 70-78 over Alabama in the final game. Okay, great, great. We, we seem to have gotten it straightened out. That's good. Yeah, I'm here. So, so I think we've gone over uh, what's remaining of the bracket and have gone over what we uh, had gotten right and some of the games that we got wrong, and we've gone through to pick uh, Alabama-Baylor in the final game and Baylor winning it. Okay, and next Tuesday night, we'll know. We'll, we'll have the final four all set. That we will, and we'll cover it right here on Philly Sports Talk, just like we're doing right now, and seeing how we did college basketball. We have a pro team here in Philadelphia that's doing pretty good. We do, but Right before, before we get to that, about the breaking news out of, out of the Eagles camp. Yeah, exactly. Um, just what broke within the last hour, the Eagles have their backup quarterback. I don't think they're going to be drafting one in the second round now since they have signed uh, Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco, University of Delaware, Joe Flacco. 36 years old. 30, 36 years old. He played for the Jets last season. In a limited capacity, threw for six touchdowns, three interceptions, 864 yards. I think they got him more for his veteran leadership and his, his knowledge of the, you know, of the game and basically a mentor for Jalen Hurts. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to bring in a guy who has a Super Bowl ring as well. No, absolutely. He's, he's, he's has 11 playoff wins, which is, I think, more than anyone besides Tom Brady that's currently active. And um, it's just a guy. It's a veteran. It's a veteran presence. We hope he doesn't get on the field because I don't think he has much left as a player. But it's just... If, he's, if he gets on the field, either Jalen's hurt or Jalen's not performing well. Right. So, uh, that's, yeah, that's that's one of those things that hopefully he, he doesn't get on the field. Unless he's getting on the field to throw a pass to Jalen, maybe he can do that. Yeah, we'll line him up as a wide receiver. Um, I mean, it's it's a good signing from the, from the vantage point that it's not going to put pressure on Jalen. He's not going to be looking over his shoulder. He's not going to be hearing footsteps. He's not going to be hearing you know, Nick Foles chance or – or Carson Wentz chance, chance. It's gonna, he's going to have a, a clear mind. He knows the job's his. 
it's going to grow. You know, it's a growing year. The Eagles aren't expected to do anything this year. They're four or five one team tops. So this is just. That's all, all that being said is true, and I see it playing out that way. But you know how the Eagles are. You never know. Something might fall with that sixth pick in the draft, and they might be drafting a quarterback. I don't know. I, of course, it would be it, it would be something that um, would be a little bit of a shock. But with with uh, the way they've drafted recently, I don't know. Yeah, it would be a shock, especially with all the wide receiver talent that's going to be on the on the board at that time. You're going to have, still have Devontae Smith. You're going to most likely have Jamar Chase and definitely Jalen Waddle. So, I mean. It, yeah, and I think Jamar Chase is there at, 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 at number six. Uh, unless, unless they can trade back to still get a, a, one of those top receivers and get, and get another pick, I think at number six, if, uh, if he's there, that's who you think. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, that's our Eagles talk for the week. We weren't we weren't even going to do Eagles, but that happened while we were on, so we had to touch on it. So like you said earlier, we do have a NBA team here in Philadelphia, and they are pretty good. They're thirty and thirteen. Thirty and thirteen. We we, we can't complain, especially losing our best player. We, we've we've held held our own. We're four and four and one since he's gone down. Just the one lost in Milwaukee, which we had a twenty point lead during that game. Five the break. All right, and they're heading out west. The Sixers, they're heading out west for a. Um, they're going to play four out west before coming back and playing Cleveland on the way back home. Uh, they started the road trip off in New York on Sunday night with an overtime victory over the Knicks, one hundred one one hundred. That was a crazy ending in that game. Uh, Julius Randle hit a shot that I think uh, was probably luckier than the shot Kawhi Leonard hit to beat the Sixers in the playoffs a few years back. This shot. <laughs> for any of those that didn't see it, he shot it from the uh, the baseline closest to the screen. It was a, a step back three pointer that caught the rim. Looked like it was going to go off left, but spun back to the right at the top of the backboard and went in. Yeah, that was one of those things to where it was a strange occurrence because right there at the end of the game, the Sixers had made a nice a nice push and they had gotten a few stops to get back to the point where they did have a three point lead with the ball. Tobias Harris gets out going in for a shot and he gets two foul shots. And Tobias Harris is, is one of the top foul shooters in the league and he ends up missing two foul shots, which gives life to the Knicks. And I'm not positive. I, mean, I know they, they were. It was down under 10 seconds, maybe maybe even under eight seconds left in the game when the Knicks called timeouts and advanced the ball to half court. And the one thing I put out on Twitter was, I wonder what's going to happen here. I'm, I'm like, it just, it just the way that night was going. It just seemed whatever three the Knicks threw up was somehow going to go in. And then, if, and then if you saw the shot that that Julius ran made, oh my goodness, it's just like. Now, the only thing I want to discuss with, with, with you, Cash, in that situation, I'm, I'm, a, I'm someone who's strong in one of those situations that when you're up three, that late foul. But that doesn't seem to be what the, what the coaches in the NBA and even a lot in college don't do. Yeah, they don't, they don't like to do it when, when the players are around the three-point line because they can go into the shooting motion and then hit, hit the three and then get the four-point play. They don't like to do it there, but I'm a big fan of doing it before before they cross midcourt, absolutely. Don't even give them the chance. Or, or even on the inbound pass. The second they get the inbound pass, then they will let them turn, wrap them up. Yeah, yeah, you put that, you put that in as a plan. And what, what you're saying is everybody plays up on their man and the inbound pass comes in. Obviously, if someone's coming off the screen and they're hoping you don't want to foul them as they're shooting. But, if you can, but the way that that happened where, where Julius got to take the ball and a few dribbles to get himself to the three-point line and everything, I just don't want to foul do it. But, I mean, Tobias Harris was right in space, and, well, like I said, you'd have to see the shot. It was, it was another one of those where he shoots that another 25 times. He, he doesn't make it that way, no. and especially with the closest as, as Tobias was playing him on defense, and, and that ball happened to just happened to just fall in. Fortunately, the shot, the better shot that he had of the night was the one to end the game in overtime, and that was in now. Oh, that, that was – I went around the rim. I thought it was good when he, when, when he shot it. Oh, it was half, yeah, halfway yeah, down and rimmed yeah, out. So I guess the, the, the luck that he got on the other yeah, shot, he had the opposite luck on this yeah, shot. So the Sixers yeah. squeezed the win out. Uh, what's his, uh, Doc, Harris, Doc Rivers was not happy after the game. He did not like the way the Sixers played. He didn't think he should take it over time to win the game. Um, 
but they did, they did survive, and that's what a good team does. They survive on the road, and they, they come away with a victory. They, they, uh, that's the first game of the road trip. It's going to be a six-game road trip. Now they head out to Golden State tonight, Oakland, and they'll take on the Golden State team without Steph Perry. So if you looked at this game before the season started, you bought tickets in, in Oakland, you thought you were going to see Steph Perry versus Joel Embiid, and you'll see... Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Stefan, Stefan, uh, and his brother. And, uh, and both, both of them are going to be, well, I don't know. Is, um, is, is uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that jersey's available. Yeah, is Seth available? I'm not sure. I, I, took, I thought he had a shot at playing the night. Yeah, I'm going to have to look at here and see if he possibly does. Um, no, he's out. He's going to remain sidelined. Yeah. So, uh, Torquemada will be filling in his for, in, in for him playing again, I, I would assume. He's done a decent job. Torquemada's done a decent job. He's putting up 17, 19. He's hitting his threes. He's trying as hard as he can on defense. I don't know how, how, well, how far that gets him. But the Sixers come into this game a four-point favorite. And, then, you know, everything goes right. They, they should come out of with a victory tonight and go, go to the 2-0. And then they'll move Thursday night to... Los Angeles to take on the Lakers. Um, yeah, that was another one of those games where it would be like the marquee matchup, so to speak. You have B going up against Anthony Davis, and you would have Ben Simmons and LeBron. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to happen either. Yeah, so what's going on? The Sixers are getting some injury uh, help from the other teams here. Exactly. Which is also affecting the MVP race. First, Joel was the favorite. He, he, he went to plus 800. And then LeBron came, became the favorite. Now he's plus 500, and Jokic has become the favorite. So uh, the way things are going, Jokic better watch his back. He's the next one Yeah. Because one thing I wanted to mention, too, that you brought up, too, that I don't know. I guess it's being talked about pretty much in Philadelphia, but I don't know if it's being talked about enough, and that's just the job that Dr. Bruce has done. And Sure. When you go back and look at that game with the Knicks, I mean, it was it was something I don't know if everybody uh, noticed it, but I but I did right away. It was something that I don't think we would have seen with Brett Brown over the last number of years. And you ain't not seen with many coaches. I mean, like you said, he wasn't happy with the fact that that game had to go into overtime. And the Knicks' first possession in overtime after the, the Sixers ended up getting caught off, 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 off the jump at midcourt. And uh, the ball went out of bounds off of uh, a Nick, and then the Sixers uh, turned the ball over, and the Knicks came down and hit a three pointer. And I guess it, um, it was the guy, is it Burks? Uh, Alex Burks. Yeah. Six last year, he hit a wide open three. And before you know, Doc Rivers was off the bench all time out. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what to do. You're, 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 you're less than 15, 20 seconds into overtime, and all that time out, and even though the Sixers did end up coming back and taking the lead and then getting down four, it, 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 it did turn out. But I, I, I was happy to see that. And that was something I don't think we would have seen with Brett Brown. He would have just let him play. And that three point lead could have turned into a seven, eight, nine point lead, and then the game's over at that point. Yeah, I mean, Doc Rivers and, and Brett Brown don't even belong in the same sentence. I mean, they're, Doc Rivers is a, is a Hall of Fame coach. Yeah, you gotta put him. You gotta put him in the sentence with Larry Brown, not Brett Brown. Exactly, exactly. Doc Rivers has done an outstanding job this year. He's he's probably won five games by himself, which is, you know the difference between being twenty five and eighteen or thirty and thirteen. I mean, Doc is is probably the coach of the year in the NBA right now. He's he's got at least be in the conversation, and and sometimes it's like. Oh, I'm looking out there, and, I, and it's just because of how we've been conditioned here in Philadelphia over the years with Brett Brown. I'm looking out there, I'm like, this doesn't make sense, or this doesn't seem like what we've been used to. And I'm like, hey, look at that. The game's over, and they won. <laughs> Which before, there was a lot of stuff where, where if you're sitting there shaking your head, what is Brett Brown doing? It usually turned out to be that he was doing something that was causing the Sixers not to succeed, where right. this issue. It's this year what Doc's doing is, is causing them to succeed. Hopefully, I don't chase him for a night. He does something stupid. Nah, I don't think he will. He doesn't, he doesn't do things. He doesn't do stupid things. Uh, last year, every every game the Sixers lost, we weren't blaming the players. We were blaming the coach. And, uh, 
it looks like, it looks like we were right. We have this basically the same players this year. A couple, couple, you know, Danny Green and Seth Curry, a couple new additions, but it's the same, you know, core. And look at the difference when you put a coach there. I mean, this is a guy, Doc Rivers, too. I th- what do you think? When you think of Doc Rivers, you're going to think of the 3 1, but it would have lead two 3 1 leads in, in Western Conference Finals. And, you know, that's, that's a tough, tough thing to get over. But he did win an NBA title in 2007 with Boston. And he did reach the finals again in 20, 2010 with Boston. So, I mean, the guy's been there, done that. If he doesn't blow those two 3 1 leads, the guy's in four, four NBA finals in his career. I mean, he probably would have won one of those. We go to zero. Lakers game. I can't see them losing that game. That would put us a three zero. The Clippers. I think that's 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 a lot to ask. Beat the Clippers, but you never know. It could be a Kawhi Leonard and Paul George night off. <laughs> the way things are going. But, but for now, I'll mark it down as a loss. Probably another loss in Denver. That's a tough place to play with the elevation and all. And then coming back home, can you lose to Cleveland again? Not coming back home. The game before they come back home. season they are home and we might have had a parade that season. He's still running and still probably playing basketball. He, he can't just sit. You know, he has, he has to stay in shape because when he comes back off a two-week uh, injury, it's probably going to be three weeks by the time he comes back. 
He needs to be in basketball shape. Yeah, exactly. And it's just a matter of the fact that, you know, it's going to be one of those things to see how much pain is in that knee and, and, if that, and is it something he can play with or if it's something that's going to cause him to have to rest more. And it's just going to be one of those things once he gets out there. I mean, of course, you know it's in the first five minutes that he's out there, someone's going to bump into that knee or he's going to fall down again because he, he's prone to doing that. And it's just going to have to be a wait and see and, and, and hope everything just goes back to how it was before the injury. Yeah, hopefully we won't have to deal with it again. Hopefully he's injury-free the rest of the year and through the playoffs and Ben Simmons can be healthy through the playoffs. I just want to see the two of them throughout the whole playoff. It just hasn't happened. Last year, Simmons was out the year before his Embiid had his stomach issues and every year it seems to be something else. I want to see them, what the whole team go through. Hopefully, top seed too. Because Brooklyn's, yeah, ha- Brooklyn's having their problems as well. Kyle Irving did not make the trip. They're out, they're out on the West Coast as well. They're on a five-game West Coast trip. So all they, all they have is James Harden. So hopefully they can drop three or four or three or three or five while they're out there and six just don't lose any ground. But Milwaukee is, is, is the other problem. They're, 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 they've won seven straight. So. Yeah, I, think, I think Brooklyn's taking on the uh, Portland. They're, they're in Portland tonight. Yeah, they're, they're playing Portland. Portland. They're, they're, Portland's a three-and-a-half-point favorite in that game. Never an easy place to win. Well, at least, at least it's never an easy place for the Sixers to win. No. Now, yeah, Portland, the road, no, it's, it's, not, it's not always. So Especially, now, Cash, now, now, Cash, where, where do you come down still on the idea of adding a piece to this team? Or is what you've seen over the last few games something that leads you to think this team is good enough the way it is, leave it alone? No, I was thinking about it today. I was thinking, what do they need? Uh, they don't need the defense. They, they, they don't, don't need scoring. scoring. They're scoring 129 points a game without Embiid. I, 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 I'm thinking, what do they need? <laughs> well, do they need that? But do they need that guy who hits that big shot during yeah. the playoffs when needed? I'm not saying at the end of the game. I'm just saying when, when another team goes on a little run or you, fall, or you start to see yourself slipping a little bit, do they need another guy who you can go to who's going to make that shot, who's going to drive to the basket and get that foul and get things turned back the right way? Uh-oh. Is there two names? Is Shake Milton? Is Seth Curry enough? No, I mean when I when I think about what do they need, they need they need a, a, a tough player. They need a they need a, a Kyle Lowry. But then another name that comes into my my, my mind is, is Victor Oladipo. Absolutely, I would take him over Lowry at this point. But that's not to say. But that's not to say I wouldn't want to add Lowry. I mean, now Oladipo is twenty nine. Just turned twenty nine. He, he seems older, but he's he's only twenty nine. Uh, he, he's that he's that that Jimmy Butler piece that we had a few years back. That extra piece. Yeah, he's averaging twenty eight and five, so that's not yeah. that, that, that's not something to just uh, right. turn away from when, when you're looking to try to make make that trade. Now, now that's that that's him doing that on teams where he's one of the main options. Right. He, would, he would be he has to fill a different role on the Sixers. Exactly. But but bringing in a guy like that. I, like I say, I would, I would have no problem if the Sixers uh, made a move to try to go for the win this year and, and they went out got Kyle Lowry. That would not be a problem in my book. But if they had their choice, I'd take Victor Oladipo at this point. All right, because first, like you said, to win this year, Oladipo can win for the next four years. Lowry's, Lowry's just going to be this year. Yeah, I don't know what Oladipo's contract is. I don't know if it's something that expires here at the end of the year, or if it, I, I don't know if they have to then resign him. But I, but I would think he would. I would think him more than Lowry would want to stay with the Sixers. You know, would the Sixers want to stay with Lowry though? Well, what I'm saying is, I think Lowry would, would leave the Sixers. I think Oladipo would want to stay. Right. Which is, so we're both leaning towards towards the, towards Oladipo. And you know what? You know what's an interesting thing if you think about it. Whether they add somebody this year or not, let's say they add Kyle Lowry and then he walks at the end of the year, or or they add Old Depot and he is no longer on the team next year. You you still start with Simmons and Bean and Harris and Seth Curry. That's not a bad four to start your team with going into the next season. No, not at all. But I mean, if, I think that if you come up with a trade this season, you're probably going to let. Uh, Curry might, might have to go, go in the trade, <laughs> or, or or Green. Yeah, I would think I would think you'd have to. I would think you probably would look at losing Danny Green. You would probably look at, at, at losing Tyrese Maxey. 
maybe maybe losing Shane Milton, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And then, of course, Mike Scott had, would probably have to be thrown into a deal just, 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 just when you look at trying to match up money. And I did, I did not put in there um, uh, the D side because at this point, I want to keep the D side. Now, now, if it comes down to Matisse Sidemore winning a championship, of course, bye-bye. But at this point, he, he looks like the way he's playing defense is someone who I would like to see the Sixers keep. Yeah, he's a guy that I, I did not like when they first drafted him. I didn't want another guy that was just a 3 and D guy that actually couldn't really shoot the 3, just, just play D. But his D is top-notch. He's a, he's a top-five defender. and he's, his, his arms are in every passing lane. He, I think... He leads the league in steals per minute. The guy is a shutdown defender. And second year. It's the second year. And him out there with Simmons is that that's what they're gonna need to take on a team like Brooklyn with three superstars. You're gonna have to shoot you can't just go out there and out outscore them, you're gonna have to stop them. It was interesting too in the in, in the Knicks game the other night and uh, the the announcers for the Sixers made a good point of it. They're the, the, the Sixers were were, try, were running their offense uh, through Tobias Harris. He got he actually was getting triple teamed, and, and in the one possession, he kicked it out to a, to a wide open thigh ball, and he hit that three, and it was just like, yeah, that's if, if he can be that player, where, out, where, where where he can be passed to out of a double and triple team, yeah, that's that's what the Sixers need. But like I said, if if, if he's if he's someone that would have to go in a deal that causes this team right now become a legitimate contender and you can actually win it, I'd have, I'd have to say goodbye to him even though I wouldn't want to. Yeah. All right, as much as we love talking, talking Sixers, Sixers and we love talking Philly sports, sports, we're going to have to get, we're going to have to go on to the, uh, the Phillies and we're going to do that right after this. You're listening to Philly Sports Talk right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Uh, I did <laughs> Welcome in to the Neutral Zone. I'm your host, Robert Cavanaugh, and you're listening to IE Sports Radio. If you like big, nasty hits, if you like slap shots, straight to the neck, if you like it, when the world the guys, and the big boys get down. And this is your show on IE Sports Radio. This is the Neutral Zone. May our shots on goal always be true and straight to the net. If they are not, may they be followed up, redirected, or change collected. Let's go on IE Sports Radio with me, your host, Robert Cavanaugh, and this is The Neutral Zone. What's good? Fight fans, it's your boy, Marcus Los Great. Here to give you what you want. Here to give you what you need. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to you live. Straight from your mama's basement with a crispy, crispy white tea. <laughs> They are coming to you live every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports.
Welcome back to Philly Sports Talk. It's been another great show. It's been 50 minutes. This just flies by. We, we, we almost need two, three hours to do our show, it seems like, Chris. We're going to do a full Phillies preview, but we're just not going to have the time. We're going to do it next week because next week's going to be two days before the season starts. So we'll have the final rosters in by then, and we'll, we'll be able to talk about every player on the, on the roster and see you know who got cut and who made the team. Uh, real quick, though, we're going to go to Chris for his Flyers minute. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. And you are listening to Philly Sports Talk with Cash and Chris right here every Tuesday from 8 to 9 on IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. Yes, we'll touch on the Flyers right now. The Flyers are not a playoff team. They're very disappointing. This is going to be another season without Stanley Cup. That's all I have. Back to you, Cash. That'll conclude our Flyers minute here on Philly Sports Talk. Maybe next week it'll be our Flyers second. Or we'll just skip them completely. Okay. That's fine. Well, yeah, we, we do have a couple um, Phillies points to make. They did, they did send Mickey Moniak, the former number one pick, back to the minors today, which was, you know, a little surprise for me. I thought maybe he had a shot at coming off the bench as a pinch hitter this season. Um, they just didn't feel he was ready. He had another tough spring. And, it looks like Roman Quinn will probably be the opening day center fielder, is my guess right now. Oof. <laughs> exactly. Uh. <laughs> I guess he'll be uh, he's he's going to lead off the season with a bunt. Well, hopefully, because that's, that's his best chance of getting on base. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> uh, maybe he can get some uh, lessons from Bryce Harper on the drag bunt down the third baseline. Yeah, well, he, yeah, he does switch hits, so yeah, possibly. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 if he gets on, it's a double, so I don't see exactly. why he's going to be funny more. But, uh, yeah, and also, pitcher Ranger Suarez, who was Gabe Kapler's favorite pitcher on the Phillies when Gabe was the manager here, he also was sent down along with Mickey Moniak. Just say it isn't, say it isn't so. so. Oh, I mean, yeah, we were talking a little bit before before we came on tonight, and it's like, this, this guy has... Uh, I don't know. My only thing when I think of Ranger Suarez is he comes in and the first two batters are on base within three or four pitches because he's hit him, and then he's walking the next guy and bases are loaded, and there's nobody out. So maybe he should stay in the minors. You know why if Ranger Suarez is in the major leagues? Because he throws with his left hand. That's why. That's, yeah, that's true. He, he does, and he does. He, He's not a hard thrower either. I mean, I know they tried him in the bullpen. They tried him as a starter, and it's just time to move on from him. But the Phillies, there's certain guys the Phillies just seem that they never want to move on from. Vince Velasquez, Hector Neres, Ranger Suarez. No, I'm, a, I'm looking at Ranger Suarez's stats. Isn't it, is it right, right he's, he's only pitched, pitched seven games, games in the majors? Is, is that his stats as a starter? No, it says total games. Uh, career stats, that's got to be wrong. I mean, it seems like he's honored us for way more than seven games. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> Let me check baseball reference because, it... yeah, that can't be right. Nah, it's wrong. Okay. I don't know where, I don't know where they got those stats from. That, that, that was on that's on the MLB on the Philly website. website. They have the wrong statistics up there for him. Well, they're trying to make him look better than he really is. Yeah, <laughs> he really is. <laughs> well, and also, if we're going to talk about Philly's pitching, we have to mention that they announced that Aaron Nola for the fourth straight year will be the opening day starter for the Phillies. And um, yeah, I think that's a good idea to start the season with the guy who lost game one last year, and he also lost the last game last season. Um, for me, for me, I don't know. I've never been a fan of Aaron Nola. The guy's 7-14 and 14 in September. His ERA in September is 4.3. He'd probably be a lot higher, but he's never in the games long enough in September because uh, he's getting taken out. And, yes, as a guy who is a number three, maybe on a, on a team that has uh, two better starting pitchers, he can fill in, in my opinion, as, as a number three. I know a lot of people think he's an ace, but... I just don't think he throws hard enough. I think he has too many base runners at times in games. And the thing with Aaron Nola that has always frustrated me is he will look like a Cy Young candidate for a month or two during the season, but then there's always going to be those stretches that are problems. And 
if you go back to two years ago, this is back when Gabe Kaplan was still uh, managing the team. They had put out, uh, I think it was maybe the last eight stars of the season, because they were going to pitch Aaron Nola every five days. And they said, he will be the games that he's going to pitch for his last eight stars over the last two months of the season. Who is it with one of those games? I don't think I, don't think I have to say anymore. No, and, and the Phillies, the Phillies paid Aaron Nola like a guy that you just explained. They didn't pay him like an ace. They paid him four years, forty-five million. And at the time, I said that was coming off the year where I think he finished third in the Cy Young to uh, the Degrom. And that was the 2018 season. Yeah, and he signed a four-year, forty-five million dollar contract. I thought he was it would be upset, but see, see him talk about it. He said he just wanted to go fishing. He didn't need that much money. He's from, he's from Louisiana. He likes to fish. He's, He's a simple, simple guy. guy. I, I think, think they're going to give him four years, uh, 30 million, he would have been happy. They didn't pay him like an ace. I mean, we'll see next time around what he gets. Well, and the thing, too, is it's, yeah, when you listen to him, like in, in uh, interviews or if it's post game or something like that. You can't tell whether he's won the game or lost the game. He's he's got he's got the same demeanor all the time, which which I guess can be a good, a good thing at times because you don't get too down on loss, you don't get too too up on on a win. Mm-hmm. But he's, 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 he's the same he's the same demeanor as Ryan Blaney. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, Ryan, well, Ryan Blaney. Uh, Worked out pretty well for him this past weekend. I know, that's, that's what, what made me say it. I said, I said, I said, well, I said watch this reaction when he wins. Yeah, yeah. What, what do, do you think, Ryan? You won. Yeah, it's a great, great card. Great, 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 great job. Yeah. I don't know. The last thing I'll say on Nola, he's one of those guys where, where when, when the games are close, it's, it always seems like it's going to be that one inning that's going to get him. Or the Phillies do have a decent lead that's going to be that one bad inning or he's going to give up that one bad home run. You can just see that it's coming. And like I said, here's the thing, too. We'll probably be on here throughout the season and say, well, Aaron Nolan won that seven stars, ZRA is 1.4, and the Phillies are just a different team when he's on the mound. And that'll be seven games between June – and, and, and the end of July, and then once August hits, it's going to be like, what happened to the guy? Yeah. yeah, there'll be a game against the Braves where he gives up five runs in the first two innings, and we'll trash him again. But... Yeah, yeah, the Braves, the Braves, the Braves, we play the Phillies um, in an important three-game series. He'll, he'll, get, he'll get a game one, and then we'll have to play the Phillies in the second game. Yeah. And then we we'll have to play the Phillies in the second game. Yeah. And then we'll have to play the Phillies in the second game. Yeah. He, he tries to put too much, and he's relaxed, relaxed in the games against, you know, uh, the, the, the Washington on a Tuesday night in May. He's, he's, he's relaxed. I, I don't know. I, I, I guess the psychologist in me would say once once he gets to the point where it seems like there's some pressure, Aaron Nola just shrinks. There's, there's, there's other guys who rise to it, and there's other guys who shrink. I mean, last year... Yes, they could have won. I, I believe it was one of his last three starts. They would have been a, a playoff team. Or if he wins that opening day game, uh, the Phillies would have made the playoffs. I don't think they would have been in the World Series. It would have been, it's just been nice to see them in the playoffs. But at some point, you got if you are that number one guy, who everyone's calling an ace, and you're coming into that game where you're going, whether you're pitching against the Grom up in New York, or you're pitching late in September, or especially like last year. It's the last game of the season against against the Tampa team that's already in the playoffs, and we need this one win out of you to get there. I mean, Aaron, you need the ace of your pitching set to be a guy who can look at the rest of the players and say, guys, I got this for you. Come out there and give your heart to We'll win this game, and on we go. And that's just not Aaron Olsen. No, it hasn't been in the spring either. He's no, a- He's been horrible this spring. He's given up 10 runs in 14 innings. Yes. Now, now yesterday he did throw six shots, six uh, shutout innings, and uh, one hit ball against the Yankees yesterday. But it's the same thing. People say, well, yeah, it's like a microcosm of his regular season. So before that, he gave up, he gave up 10, 10 runs in, in eight innings. Yeah, exactly. And you can't. Uh, people always say, well, you can't say too much about what goes on at spring training. Well, don't hit the six. Uh, in, yesterday, and then turn around and say, well, you can't downplay how bad he was a couple games before. But he's going to be starter next week, so we'll see. It's against Savannah, so hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll turn out uh, well for the Phillies. Um, I guess that was in, I guess 2019, Harper's first year. Yeah. Uh, 
Aaron Noah won that, that opening day game against, against the way. That was that, I think that's when they swept the man at the start of the season and it looked like they were going to be um, a World Series team, but that didn't um, pan out either. It hasn't panned out. The Phillies have actually have the longest drought in the National League of not making the playoffs, which is surprising to say the least. With the, you know, the rosters they've had in the past couple of years, they haven't made the playoffs. Well, once they got through that stretch between 2007 and 2011, once that once that was over, they went south quickly. Yeah. Sorry. All right. All right. Well, like, like we said, next week we'll have more in depth into the Phillies as we start their season. Two days after we're on the air next Tuesday night from eight to nine, and we'll go over uh, position by position and take a look at actually who is on that roster for the Phillies and who's going to fill out the bullpen and who's going to actually fill out the bench. Yes, we will, and that'll lead us to our normal final segment, which is our. Our secret favorite sport, not <laughs> our, uh, our our favorite hobby, our favorite thing to watch, I think, is a NASCAR. Um, last last week was a great race. Kyle Larson dominated uh, about what ninety percent of the race, and uh, towards the end, he just he couldn't hold off Ryan Blaney. Ryan Blaney had the best long run car, which I saw throughout the race, but when it came to the final uh, stage, the final stage that went caution free, so. The best long run car, which was Blaney, was going to was going to run down Larson, and he did. He ran him down, beat him by about two seconds. And, uh, well, that was that was one of those things too. When you were watching that race, you could you could see that Blaney in- incrementally was just catching up, catching up, and getting and getting stronger, getting stronger. And everybody else near near the front, especially Larson, was was kind of staying around the same. And like you said, they're right, right, right again when he had it. Lane's car was the best car out there, and, and he, was, he was able to, to utilize that and win the race. Yeah, which brings us to next week. Dirt racing at Bristol. First time since 1970 NASCAR will be on the dirt. Yeah, who do you like in that one? Well, Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson's the dirt track racer. I mean, he's... Exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I hear Michael, Michael McDowell likes to race off on the dirt also. He's a he's a uh, he's a slipper. Yeah, but I I, I, I do agree with you. Um, he should have his 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 way next week with, with that race car, um, Carlos. But uh, yeah, like the way NASCAR has gone this year is it, one of those things where every race has had has had a new and surprising winner. Yeah, I mean, and if you look at next week's um, lineup, there's a lot of drivers that you've never heard of in this race. There, there's, there's guys that are be, that'll be driving cars that you won't know their names. Stuart Friesen's driving the 77. Stuart Friesen drives in the, in the Xfinity Series. Shane Golubic, a, a, a dirt, dirt track specialist, will drive in the 78 car. Um, Anthony Alfredo, he's made a couple starts. He'll be in the race. Um, Chris Windham, who I'm not familiar with, will be driving the 15. Um... Corey LaJoy is in the race. Austin, Austin, Austin Dillon's also a good uh, dirt track racer. And Qu- Quinn Hoff, he's back. He's, he's going to be driving a double zero. zero. So a lot of guys that you don't normally see will be out there next week. So can one of them get a NASCAR Cup Series win on the dirt? It's very, it's very, it's very possible. Yeah. And especially like, 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 like I said, I know it doesn't, it doesn't play into every race, but with the uh, races this year and having uh, no repeat winners so far, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something to look, forward, to look forward to seeing if, if that can happen. Which would be even crazier if a guy like, you know, Chris Windham, who I just mentioned, or Stuart Friesen, if they can win, they qualify for the playoffs? That I don't know. I know. If they're, if they're not a regular, I guess, I guess not, right? Yeah, they're not. So I'm not sure if they. I, I don't. I don't know if you win and then you can turn yourself into being a regular or not. That's that's something that we'll have to look up. Or if, yeah. or if there's someone there uh, in the uh, message board, uh, yeah. have the answer for us. Any any NASCAR uh, specialist on the on the message board have the answer? I, I know when we watch the Xfinity races, it has the I next to their like when Kyle Busch runs an Xfinity race, he has I next to his name, which means he's ineligible for points. Right. Right. So. 
I haven't seen that in, in, in the Cup Series, though. That's a good question. I think if you win a race, I think you're in the playoffs. Wait, Wait Justin Haley, he won at Daytona a few years back, right? Yeah, yeah, I don't think, think he was in it, though. though. We'll, we'll have the answer next, next week. I'll look into it. it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we come up with some good ones. ones. We'll, we'll definitely start off our uh, talk week, uh, with, with the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah and, and especially, especially if somebody, somebody wins the race, race that we don't expect, expect we'll, we'll definitely, definitely have, have the answer. answer. Yeah, maybe uh, this, this week, I'm, I'm not sure I have to look, but I guess that William Byron will be in, in, in the... Uh, Races that we get first. All the reason I bring that up is because it's correspondence by the university. <laughs> the 24th car, yeah, William Byron is, is an entry. He is in the race, yes. That's, that's cool. I, 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 as being a Denny Hamlin fan uh, for as long as I have, I still have to, to, to pull for uh, Byron a little bit here because he's driving uh, the Liberty University car. <laughs> and also, also, what we learned last week, week was that Liberty plays in the furnace. furnace. Yes. In the front, and it's actually called the uh, Vine Center, but is nicknamed is nicknamed the furnace. And for any of you out there who were uh, listening last week and following and follow along, uh, especially with high school basketball, I made a mistake. Uh, the school I graduated from, Columbia High here in Columbia, Pennsylvania, actually won the uh, state championship, the double A state championship in 1987. I said 86, that's when the season started. I was a freshman in 86, 87, but they won the 87 championship. So he just wanted to correct that. That's what we do. We, we make, make corrections. corrections. I, uh, I, I, I go over, over the show every week, week and you listen back, and I say, well, what are you talking about? I think I, think I said Bryce Harper, Harper had his first start last week, week after having 12 at-bats. That's not, that's not possible. <laughs> no, but, but you were correct. He was, he was starting the next game. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That, that uh, I, guess I guess wraps, wraps it up here. here. Yes, yeah, so something to look forward to next week. What we are going to try to work into the show that we had discussed. Uh, we don't know which one of us will start off, but what we will do with us being a little bit older, we're going to pick a Philly sports memory and discuss it in one segment for a few minutes. Just uh, one memory that um, comes to mind over the years. It doesn't actually have to be a positive memory. And knowing how things are going to fill out, if you want to like it, it'll be a negative memory. And hopefully it's something that can uh, generate some interest from some people who are a little bit older listening to us and some more uh, chat. So we'll try yeah. to add that into the weekend. As you notice, we've gone over... But there's no show following us, so we're happy to be here. We're happy to talk all that is Philly sports. And I want to remind everyone that Philly Sports Talk is 8 to 9 each week. And you're listening right here to Philly Sports Talk with Cash and Chris on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great week. <laughs>